This is a short video about uniformly continuous functions on a domain. So if A is a subset of uh, the real line, and if F is a function whose domain is A, we're gonna say that F is uniformly continuous on A if the following happens. So I'm about to give you an, another epsilon delta type of definition. So for every epsilon, there should exist a delta that's positive, such that for all X and Y in your domain, such that, uh, that are within delta of each other, then the output should be within epsilon of each other. Now, what I want to do is on the same screen, I want to write right below this, what was the definition of us being continuous on A? So recall that F's continuous on A without that adjective uniformly. Uh, if for all epsilon greater than zero and for any X that's in your domain, there should exist a delta such that if Y is an A is within delta of that X, then the outputs f of x and f of y should be within epsilon of each other. And what I wanted to do is get these side by side so that you can kind of see the differences between what's regular continuous on a domain versus what's it mean to be uniformly continuous on the domain. So the big thing is notice here, for every epsilon, there exists a delta. And so notice the order that we wrote these symbols in, that delta only depends on epsilon. It doesn't depend on where you are in your domain. So this one epsilon, so I'm sorry, this one delta that depends on epsilon, it should work for any two points in your domain that are that close to each other. Whereas, if you look at the definition down here of discontinuous, the order of the symbol says for each epsilon bigger than zero and for each point in your domain, you should be able to find a delta such that if y is within uh, delta of that particular x that we've started with. So in particular, in a nutshell, uniform continuity, given an epsilon, there should be maybe a single delta that'll work for all x and y in your domain. Um, that are with, so what do I mean by that'll work? That's a little bit fishy. So such that if X and Y are in delta, within delta of each other, then the output should be within epsilon of each other. So again, delta only depends on epsilon for uniformly continuous. Whereas for continuous, or just for continuity, I'm saying given an epsilon, you might need a different delta depending on what x you're actually considering. So in other words, again, the order here, right? For each epsilon and for each x and a, this delta might depend on both of those things. Whereas again, up here, delta only depends on epsilon for uniform continuity. So let's do some examples and a picture too. So we've looked at this example before, I think, and I think what I mean to say is, oh, I'm good with that, is uh, one over x, on the interval from say zero to one, it's continuous, but it's not uniformly continuous. And what I wanna do is just give you a picture about why. And so if I was to have some arbitrary number epsilon, what if I made this epsilon window around f of two? So my function's one over x, so f of two would be a half. And so what I'm looking at then, for two here, I should be able to find some delta so that every, uh, so maybe I should say it this way, right? Every x value I pick in this window, in this orange interval, its output should land somewhere in this red interval, right? So in other words, like this blue part of the graph should never pop out of that box. So what uniform continuity says is I should be able to pick up that box and uh, I should be able to move it uh, around to any point, right? That same delta should work no matter where I put the box at on the graph. And so what I see though, is what if I move closer to the left, right? Where this function starts to behave a little bit more badly. It starts to get really, really tall, really fast. So what if I put for that same epsilon, um, I put now that window of radius epsilon around two, right? So two would be the output of a half for this function one over x. And so does that same delta, does that same delta work? And what I see is no. So for these x values, right? I see that parts of my graph are above uh, and below the graph for that box there, right? So again, the closer I get to zero, sort of a bad point for one over x, you know, the more badly behaved that function is. So again, that delta on the, on the right, it doesn't work like it did on the left. So maybe uh, to sum it up one more time, given an epsilon, the delta that works over here, and when I say that works, I mean that uh, satisfies the definition of uniform continuity, right? That delta no longer works once I look at the picture on the right. So let's do some more examples about getting comfortable with that definition of uniform continuity. So what if I look at the function f of x just as x, then uh, or think of it as y equals x, so line with slope one through the origin. I claim that that function is uniformly continuous on the real numbers. 
And so just to remind you, I like to do the scratch work in green. When you're playing with these epsilon definitions, it's good to work this out ahead of time before you actually try to write like a formal proof out. But here's the definition that I'm just plopping down. And so just as we've done before, right, I'm gonna start here and try to manipulate it so that I can get an X minus Y, an absolute value. Well, in this case, since my function is just uh, f of x equals x, um, this is the same thing as x minus y. So if I want that to be less than epsilon, why don't I just let delta be epsilon? And so uh, in a picture, right, what I'm saying to you is, if I, there's the graph. What I should be able to do, and let's see if I can actually do this, I should be able to pick up that kind of yellow window is determined by uh, my delta, which is the same thing as epsilon. And if I was to move it to maybe another point on the graph, right? Again, the graph should never pop out of there. And so hopefully you see that. So that same delta works no matter where I'm at. So in other words, delta really just depended on what epsilon was. It doesn't depend on the x value that you actually start with. Uh, so what's the formal proof look like? Well, let's let epsilon be bigger than zero and take a delta to be epsilon. Well, then for all real numbers x and y, such that x is within uh, x and y are within delta of each other, which again is what this says, then we see that's the outputs f of x minus f of x, f of y. That's the same thing as just this, which is less than delta, which is the same thing as epsilon. So not too hard of a proof there. Let's do another example. I want to show that the function 1 over x is uniformly continuous on this new interval from 1 to infinity. So again, these ideas of continuity, right? Not only does it depend on your function, maybe your function's weird or goofy, but it also depends on the domain that you're considering it on. And so uh, again, if I start like with this definition here, which is in green, just to get you a place to start working from, again, I want to find a delta that'll make this happen. And so if I start there in the green, f of x minus f of y is less than epsilon. What is f of x? You take the reciprocal of your input, so 1 over x minus 1 over y. And let's start playing with that. So if you get a common denominator, it should be the same thing as the absolute value of x minus y over xy. And now I want to start thinking about where do my x's and my y's actually live? Like, what's my domain? Why does the domain matter? Well, if x and y come from 1 to infinity, then I know that x and y are at least 1. But now let's think about this fraction here. So that fraction then, this fraction uh, will be the biggest whenever its denominator is smallest. And well, that means that what happens if the denominator is one? And so this fraction should just be less than or equal to just the numerator on its own, which is awesome because again, I try, what I'm we're always going for is to get absolute value of f of x minus f of y, get that to relate somehow to the absolute value of x minus y. And we're there. So again, I just need to take delta equal to epsilon. I think I've got another picture for you where my graph looks like this, and it's the same idea where for any epsilon that you give me, if you take delta equal to epsilon, then this window that I've put around that output there, let's see if I can catch them all. If I was to take this window and like pick it up, oop, I didn't get the highlighted part, did I? Let me try again. Let's try this. If I was to pick that up and move it to this other point that I have labeled, then it should still be the case that the blue never pops out of that window, which you see that it doesn't. That's what we're trying to say. So again, that single delta would work for epsilon. It doesn't depend on where you are on the graph. It doesn't depend on the input x. Okay, so what's the formal proof look like, by the way? So let's let epsilon be bigger than zero. Just let delta be epsilon. So then for all x and y that are in the interval from one to infinity that are within delta of each other, and that's a quick way to say that, uh, we see that the outputs, f of x minus f of y, the distance between those two, I'll do my same stuff where I get a common denominator and I'll do the exact same logic where, again, if you're actually writing this out, it's clear here, x and y are in one to infinity, therefore, I'm about to make this jump that this fraction is just less than or equal to the numerator. Again, because the denominator is at least one. So therefore, that is less than epsilon since this was chosen to be less than delta.